Vanuatu is an island group of primitive extremes. A land of active volcanoes, strange cargo cults, disfiguring rituals, and a bone-breaking ceremony to ensure a good yam harvest. War came to Vanuatu, and so did James Michener with his Tales of the South Pacific. Vanuatu is alive with legends. In the shadow of Tanner Island's active volcano, the mighty Yasur, the strangest of cargo cults is performed. February the 15th is John Frum Day, the day when the Sulphur Bay villagers believe their messiah will return, bringing all the cargo he has promised them. The endless supply of Coca-Cola, cigarettes, radios and jeeps they saw in World War II. After the flag raising ceremony, there's a military parade. Men carry rifles made from bamboo. Each soldier believes himself to be a member of the Tannese army, a special unit of the American armed forces. Soldiers march up the volcano slope to the crater rim. Yasu means old man. This volcano is their version of heaven or hell, where a person's spirit is believed to go after death. The cultists believe that John Frum now lives in the volcano, along with a huge army of some 10,000 men or spirits, for it's mighty hot down there. John Frum's followers have been waiting since 1945, and nothing has happened yet, no matter how much they perform. glow of the volcano, the villagers chant for the return of their messiah. Captain Cook's ship Resolution anchored in this bay and he named it Port Resolution. Little changed for 200 years until a dugong took up residence here. Hi Stanley. Hi Dan. The people in the village, they told me that you know the legend of the dugong out here. Yeah, can you tell me? There is a dukon living in the bay, and we believe he came to us because of a special event that happened long ago. The women were preparing food for cooking, and since they had no salt in those days, they cooked in salt water. Amelia took her coconut water containers down to the bay to fill them up. She saw a big creature in front of her. She was scared and called her husband, Kassara, Kassara, look, a big fish, spirit, spirit. Kassara rushed down with his spear and stood posed to throw it. The Dukong said, stop, do not kill me. My name is Kassara, the same as yours. The Dukong was not speared and came closer to the beach and turned into a stone. Kassara placed the Dukong stone under a tree where it still remains today. Kassara told his wife about a dream he had. 
where the Dukon came to him and said it was now going to help the people of the village because Kassara didn't spare it. Port Resolution soon prospered because of the Dugong. The villagers built a native style resort for the many people who come to see the famous Dugong. They call him in by thumping the water. In his loneliness, he is friend to all the people because he has no other mate. Ben Crop's son Adam and Lynn Roberts join Ben in an exhilarating swim with the friendly dugong. and learning skills are truly amazing. It catches up with the canoe and hangs on with both flippers for a tow. may seem rotund, but it's actually skinny. Perhaps he spends too much time with people and insufficient time feeding on the seagrass. Local villager, Nelson, is far too boisterous with the dugong. It resents being held by the tail and roughed up. Its mood changes and Ben, with camera close by, receives the brunt of its anger. Oh, wow! He's wild! He hit my body and my camera so hard, I think he dislikes the lens. He's after Nelson now. So you play rough today. <laughs> Feel a little bit sore. That was very strong. Be gentle, and the dugong will respond the same. It's definitely temperamental today. He got a bit aggressive then. He tried um, biting me in between my legs and I didn't quite want that, so I pushed him away. The dugong still associates the camera with Nelson's rough play and Ben is on the defensive again. <laughs> He's roughing me up. He doesn't like the camera or me. Captain Cook came here in 1774 and pointed to a native asking what did they call this island. The reply was Eromango, which meant this is a man. Cook's visit became a legend of a huge canoe coming ashore with a white god and other ghosts. When the islanders resisted Cook's landing, the canoe withdrew to what seemed like a floating village and sailed away into the spirit world. Jason Metty asks permission from the spirits of his forefathers to enter a sacred grave site. <laughs> 
Sandalwood traders brought a misery of disease and blackbirding, culling the population of 10,000 to a mere 400. This, uh, these bones are very respected in here in Eromango. These bones, this is our grandfathers and grandmothers from before. Uh, this place is very holy. They, uh, we, we can't remove these bones, put them somewhere, because they are, this is their place. They live here and we mustn't touch them. When the chief dies, they usually take the chief and then put them here. It's a very special uh, cemetery for the chief. These are ordinary people that are sleeping there, but this place is very holy for the chief only. So this is highly respected as a chief. Who's from here? Who's are these, Jason? They are people from the different tribes. The people from down there are from different tribes, so they had to put them separately. So you can see that uh, they, these uh, different tribes, so they put them aside here. Missionaries named this place Martyrs Island, for Eromango does have a bloody cannibal past. Now this rock here, it really has quite a gruesome tale to tell. Back in 1839, a missionary, John Williams, came here with a carpenter, uh, James Harris. Now, Williams had had quite a lot of success uh, over in Tanner Island converting the heathens, so he thought, well, he'll give it a try here with the cannibals of Eromango. Well, they did really swallow his religion, literally. They ate him. Now, when they stepped ashore, unbeknownst to Williams, the, the sandalwood traders had just a few days ago murdered some of the villagers. In fact, they'd run off with the chief's daughter. So the natives were pretty angry and they decided, right, the next white person who comes up on this beach, we're going to kill him. Well, they clubbed Harris and Williams and they ended up in the pot, as we call it, but really it was a, uh, they were baked in a bush oven. But before they baked Williams, they laid him out on this rock. And for some unknown reason, while his body was on the rock, stretched out, they chopped the stone at his heel and at his head. Literally showing him he was a, a short, stout man. And in a way, it was like an inscription on a tombstone, which I guess you could, you could sort of say, here lay missionary Williams before he was eaten. The murder of Williams and Harris certainly deterred the missionaries for quite some time. In fact, 18 years. And the next missionary that came along, he really played a few tricks on the natives, sort of little white lies. For example, when he uh, dug a well and the water gushed out, he turned around to the amazed natives and said, God did that. And when hundreds of people died from an epidemic, he said, God did that. Well, that was his undoing. They hit him on the head. So five missionaries died here on this island and many more in the other islands and even way up in the Solomons, but they were quickly replaced from the uh, missionary society with more young, enthusiastic missionaries wanting to come out here into this dangerous field. And one of them was my father. After weeks of living in grass huts, Vila's upmarket Iririki Island Resort is a welcomed luxury. Ben joins the Golden Wing trimaran. Peter Whitelaw of Sail Away Cruises is the skipper. This is uh, the Leper Island where we're going and the cave is just around the point here. Right. Ah, here's the cave. The cave has an amazing legend to tell. Then this is Felice Cave. We'll find a whole lot of uh, paintings up on the wall. Uh, men, whales, fish, I guess, uh, things that they ate. And the last person to uh, record anything in the cave was a missionary, and he put his own graffiti on the wall. And apparently the natives weren't very happy about that, and he ended up in the pot. 
I guess in a way this cave had a special reason. It was like a spirit cave where the dying or the dead were brought here and the spirit passed through the cave and onto the land of the dead. And along the rocks you'll see little finger holes. And uh, apparently this was the spirit leaving its finger mark in the cave before it passed on to the land of the dead. Then there's quite a legend associated with this cave. Long ago, about oh, 750 years ago, there was a very big chief named Roy Mata, and he brought all the tribes together. The, the, it was very peaceful, and he was in charge of not just this island, but all the neighbouring islands to the north. And his brother was quite jealous of his power, and he actually poisoned him. And while uh, Roy Mata was uh, dying, he was brought to this cave apparently for his spirit you know, to pass through to the, to the other world. And this is actually where he died. And then he was taken over to the next island, which is called Hat Head. And he was buried there along with 44 other people. And every one of those people with him were buried alive. And so the legend grew. And only a few years ago, a French archaeologist decided to go to Hat Island and he excavated and he uncovered over 40 skeletons and one of them was the chief. So even though it had been passed down all those years, that was a true legend. Oh, I can see it up ahead. Definitely graves. The uh, natives usually put all these shells around here. There's a trumpet shell, and you can see the hole here uh, that they actually drill in the trumpet so that they can blow it. They usually mark the graves with these things. So this is obviously the, uh, the grave area that they excavated, and they found 45 skeletons, of which 44 were buried alive. Beyond this island of the dead, Lynn finds a coral reef blossoming with life. North of Vila is the primitive island of Malakula. Two warrior tribes live here, the small Nambas and the big Nambas, and many of these primitive tribal villages are inaccessible except on foot. Isn't that beautiful, this vegetation? Yeah, it's lovely. Very lush. Are there any snakes in here? No, no snakes. There's a warm welcome at the small Nambas village. These warriors were once so feared, even the blackbird is kept away. They lead Lynn to the Nasara meeting place, where there's a revival of traditional dances. Passing the fruit around pushes out any bad spirits. What the, uh, the small numbers uh, tribe here in Malekula they are doing, uh, it's, it's just to keep this uh, thing alive, the uh, culture and tradition of uh, this island. They used to call this uh, Bumbuang. Bumbuang is uh, the name of the um, a man from this uh, village who have a big uh, uh, testicle. 
The man with elephantiasis longs to come out and dance. He kicks and struggles, but can't get the rhythm. one of the uh, legend where they used to play many centuries ago. In the Nasara, custom dictates that men and women are segregated. She's gorgeous. She's so cute. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice. Olivia, what is the difference between the small nambas and the big nambas that we're going to go and see? Nambas is uh, what they used to wear around the, uh, the west, and the small nambas use thin uh, clothes to wrap around their pennies, and the big nambas use the thick clothes to wrap around their pennies. In a prelude to any ceremony, the big nambas first prepare and drink kava, the intoxicating island beer. It's made from the root of a pepper shrub, the preparation a ritual in itself. Unlike alcohol, kava produces a calming effect and has amazing medicinal qualities. <laughs> Their ancestral god is honoured with the first cup of brew. Dancers with grass hats always lead the ceremony. The big Nambas specialty was tribal warfare. They would cease after killing a few of the enemy and then celebrate and feast with the victims on the menu. <laughs> to hail a boat to Wala Island, one must use their efficient communication system. Send from boat by Mikam. By time you make him send by Mikam, send boat by Mikam, big land, or current tourist scuba. It's an attractive coral isle with a grass hut resort. The island was thrust up by volcanic activity. The rocks are fossilized corals. In their primitive world, once governed by sorcery and witchcraft, George Lawrence still communicates with his dead grandfather. George asks him to send good rains and a bountiful harvest to his village. This is his grandfather. The ancestral spirit may haunt his village and family if not appeased. George, the principal male relative, will return tonight and sacrifice a pig when the moon is full. George tells me in Pigeon English of a legend concerning a cave just up ahead. First we must bow and show respect to the spirit in the cave.
Now George asked the spirit if I may film and enter the cave. I really must explain this legend. You can go to the cave. Oh, good, good. Now, what you've explained to me in this story is that long, long ago, the sun and the moon crossed the sky together. Yes. And they, they, they ate together, they prepared their food together. And then one day the sun, he needed some milk for his food, and he took a coconut and with a knife started to gouge out one of the eyes in the coconut so he could pour the milk out. And the moon was very upset and said, don't do that, stop, you are gouging out my eyes. And the sun kept doing it. And the moon got very angry with the sun. And so he refused to go across the sky with the sun. And yes. so they went their different ways across the sky. Yes. And this cave represents the moon and the sun. Of course. And they say that if you dig in this cave, you'll never reach the end. That's it, right? Yes, it is. And also that if you put your ear to the cave when the moon is full, you can actually hear the voices of the sun and the moon. Off the southern tip of Malakula is Tommen Island. Ben and Lynn travel there to meet the most unusual old man. The happy young natives are normal. Their grandfathers were not. He is old and blind, and his forehead is elongated. They call him a long head. Every time I say you're right. In the first two years of his life, his head was tightly bound every day, slowly lengthening his skull. The practice was considered to improve a person's looks. It was stopped years ago. Is he the only one left? Only one. This one. Yes, he is the last, and soon he will be gone. Ben is documenting for posterity a strange custom that will never be seen again. George Thompson is a small numbers entrepreneur. He's leading Lynn into old village ruins to show her some ancient customs. This is a stone that uh, they use it specially for disaster and also they use it for causing sickness and causing death. If they want to kill you, they can just come and put some leaf on the on this stone. Then they use it with the other stone over there. When they break the wood, they mention your name, then straight away you die in your village. Right, so it's like a doom stone. Yes. Women come here to practice drawing out this delivery stone for a safe childbirth. See, see how you pull it? If you pull it out slowly, without crossing to the other side, the lady, when the lady go for deliverance, she have to deliver it, her, her, her daughter or her, his son, safely. I believe you made a promotional visit to Germany recently. Uh, yes, I went to uh, Palin and I walked the street with my numbers. And suddenly when the people rush out and come and watch me with my numbers and they wouldn't believe how am I tracing. So they went and came around me and watched me and they really touched, they touched my body and they say, how do you feel like? I say, I'm normal. That's my way of life, my way of life. So you I walk the streets in Berlin with a banana leaf wrapped around your penis. And yes.
This is Malakula's taxi service to Bannum Bay. See ya. Bye. Nice to meet you. The name Malakula is believed to come from a tale about some French sailors who landed here. The natives wanted them to leave, so they offered copious amounts of kava and sat the sailors down on some stinging plants. When the Frenchmen sobered up, they ran around shouting, Malakul, Malakul, which meant pain in the ass. The name stuck. The Banham Bay women prepare lap lap, a favorite baked pudding made from taro, yam, bananas and coconut. The ceremony and display of magic is about to begin. These two chiefs were around when the last victim of cannibalism went into the Nambas pot, as recently as 1969. Banham Bay small numbers are proud of their magic powers. This tree has poisonous leaves. Most people should die. These magicians receive only an itch. The child is carried on a bed of just leaves. There's no support. The leaves should have fallen apart under the boy's weight. Pentecost Island was the original inspiration for the bungee jump. Their famous land dive is now a ritual to ensure a bountiful yam harvest. But its legendary origins were of a woman's successful escape from domestic violence. Centuries ago, a tribesman, Tamali, tyrannized his wife and thwarted her attempts to escape. In a final bid for freedom, she climbed a tall banyan tree, taunting her husband to follow. She secretly tied a vine to her ankle and jumped as he lunged at her. Tamali jumped too, without a vine, and plunged to his death. Yeah. Now the men of Pentecost reenact the story and build a great tower. From here they will perform the Naho, a leap into oblivion. Now we're going to start the uh, opening ceremony for the land diving. Uh, we're now ready to look at the, the opening ceremony to see the nine years old child to start the dive. Thank you. The tower is 30 meters high and each jumper goes a step higher. The lower platforms are tossed clear, the vines carefully checked. The ground is softened for the fall. Elephant ear leaves make great umbrellas. The aim is for the head to just touch the ground and the diver flip upright. Things can go wrong. I think he held himself somewhere special. I think so. <laughs> Banana leaves are wrapped around the ankle vines to keep them moist. They need to be elastic to pull the jumper back at the end of their stretch.
His is the final jump, 30 metres high. A message called out to the people below. A handful of leaves tossed as an offering for a safe fall. A little more chanting to psych himself up. Now he is ready to leap for a good yam harvest. Heavy rain has flooded the airport. Chief Willie offers to use his boat. The next stop is the island of Santo, a graveyard of World War II. War came to Santo in the form of a giant American base. Half a million soldiers went to the Pacific battlefront from here. was over, Santo became a huge junkyard of surplus war materials. What was not sold off was dumped at Million Dollar Point. Glenn Russell of Butterfly Tours takes Ben on a nostalgic tour of James Michener's true life location for the film South Pacific. This is where Michener's first landed in April 1942. Mm -hmm. His boat out was anchored not far from a copper door. That's what he said. This is where he put his dinghy. Then, after talking to this Frenchman, he caught sight of a house under the banyan tree. He made his way up towards the house, and from there, he said, few meters before he reached the house, a convenient woman walked out from her little hut, and that was Bloody Mary. Yeah. So this is Bloody Mary's brothel? Yes. And whereabouts was the hospital? The hospital used to be up on the hill, back behind you. Uh huh. Well, the legend has it that the convalescing soldiers, if they could walk down the hill from the hospital to Bloody Mary's brothel, then they were fit enough to go back to the battlefront. Yes, that, that is true. Sometimes in the evening they walk down to this place. And that's why Bloody Mary's brothel became so famous. That's right. <laughs> Sent a lot of people back to the war, didn't it? Yes. And, and I'm sure a lot of the soldiers, you know, faked their illness so that they didn't have to go back to the battlefront, but I bet they snuck down here. Yes. So some of the boys were only pretending to be sick just to come and enjoy themselves down here with Bloody Mary. And there was a house here, was there? Another yes. house? Yes. This house was a club uh -huh. for the navies and the girls. This is where they enjoyed themselves before Going back to the front? Yes. Yes. This is where James Michener first wrote, it, wrote his book, The Tales of the South Pacific, right here. We shan't forget the mystical, alluring Valley High, where the women were hidden in the war and where the soldiers longed to go. And what was this? Uh, well, Ben, this is where Nellie and Diana used to live, uh -huh. the American nurses, you remember? Yes, yes, I remember Nellie. Yes. And down here, this is where Emil de Beek, the Frenchman, Emil Had... de Beek and Basson used to live. And that was his copra plantation That's down right. there. Yes. And so uh, that is where Nellie and fell in love, and right. the story really happened, happened from there. Yes. I, and I always remember those those cute little children of his, the native yes. children, all lining up in front of Nelly, singing their beautiful little French song, looking That's so right. cute. I mean, really cute. That's and right. And Nelly absolutely horrified uh, about the whole situation. Yeah. Nelly returned to America, and Bloody Mary worked till she was 90 and died recently at 103.
Hello, Alan. Good day, Ben. Been Jeff. a long time. 35 years. Yeah, more, ba more. Back in the early 60s when we were all spearfishing and, and you were a pretty good cameraman. I, I remember the underwater photos you took. But you've been here looking after the present coolies now. Just what? on 30 years. That's something, isn't it? 30 years. You're, you're quite a legend here. Oh, well, yeah. Been here so long. <laughs> but in all that time have you found yourself a nice island girl? No, no, I've got a better one. You, I hear you've got a beautiful lady, a special lady. A very special lady, and she doesn't talk back. And will you take me down to meet her? No problem. Alan Powell's boat takes Band and Adam to the dive site only a few metres offshore. They submerge into a giant time capsule, the wreck of the President Coolidge, the largest, most intact and accessible shipwreck in the world. Adam has found the mess room, 30 metres down. She lies on her side. The line of toilets shows us that. Alan, how did you find the lady? Oh, we'd been on a much deeper dive, Ben, and we're on the back on the way we come from the stern to the bow inside the ship and uh, I just happened to look down and look back and there was the lady and then we did a bit of research and found that the lady was a Victorian lady with a ruff round her neck and it's about a metre by a metre square and it's made of ceramic and it's in the full round, it's got a back and a front to it and it was in like a room divider in the smoking and games room and we think that it must have been covered up to protect it from the troops and over the years just the boarding rotted away and uh, suddenly they appeared again. The President Coolidge was a luxury liner converted to a troop ship during the war. She hit two American mines and the captain ran the ship ashore. 5,000 troops scrambled to safety before the ship slid backwards into deep water. That's a jeep. Yes, it's the barber's chair. This is the dispensary. At 200 metres long and up to 67 metres deep, the wreck is far too big to explore on a single dive. Ben and Adam spend a week on her with Alan. He has now logged over 15,000 dives on the President Coolidge. That's a bottom time of one and a half years. Alan and his lady are a legend. There's a lengthy decompression after the deep dive. Time to not off for some or beautify the coral garden. Alan Power started feeding Boris the giant groper 28 years ago. It was the same adult size then around 150 kilos. It probably watched the ship sink 58 years ago. Come here, Adam. I'll show you something. What's this? This is a tombstone to Bossy. Bossy was a cow. <laughs> There was no actual fighting done here during the war, but the Japanese had very large submarines and they used to carry a seaplane. 
and they used to launch their seaplane at night and they used to drone around at night. They used to call them washing machine Charlies. And they used to drone around, keep the people awake at night and drop an occasional bomb. And that was to keep the troops on the, on the move. Well, the only casualty was Bossy, that was a cow. The further North Bend travels, the more primitive it becomes. They land at Motor Lava Island a few minutes before a powerful storm hits. The old terminal leaks as much as the rain outside, so there's no use waiting around until the storm abates. Ra Island is a coral isle a kilometre offshore. Passage across is by native canoe. The kids are delightful, the happiest and friendliest Ben has encountered. The guest house is surprisingly comfortable. Captain Bly called here after being cast adrift from the bounty and Father Luke Dinney relates the legend of Bly and the Sleeping Mountain. That's a Sleeping Mountain. Mm -hmm. When Captain Bly came to this island, our ancestors took him up there mm -hmm. to show him our God. And this was uh, uh, the custom in those days, that, they, that any visitor must climb that mountain to see your, your God. Yes, this is a very special mountain for us. Mm -hmm. Ben is privileged to be taken in the footsteps of Captain Bly to meet their God. Close your eyes. Uh -huh. Open your eyes. This is our God, our land, and our people. Ra Islanders say that here, at this tiny island, lives the mother of all sea snakes. They paint themselves to look like the black and white banded sea snake in preparation for the legendary sea snake dance. Okay. Ra 
Ra Island is shaped like a shark, which caused the people of Ra to be strong-willed and aggressive. They were always fighting. This aggressive attitude is called Namav, which is also the name of the banded sea snake we call a sea crate. So their sea snake dance represents their own violent behavior. They perform on the rising tide when the sea snake comes ashore to lay its eggs. They believe that the shark is scared of the sea snake, so the dance replaces their infighting, for they now have power over the shark. This has made the people of Ra peaceful. They say that when their god named this island Ra, he meant, that is good. And so it is. Happy people on a lovely isle who rekindle another legend of the South Pacific. Uh, usually, when we perform the sea snake dance in the land, uh, it means that we must have to go back to the sea and swim. Uh, it do means that when we swim in the sea, the sea snake just goes back to the sea. No, 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 no.